Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm Mary Fran Johnson. I'm your host today and a contributing columnist on CIO.com, where I write about boardroom issues for technology leaders. Twice a month, we produce CIO Leadership Live with the generous support of my colleagues at CIO.com and the CIO Executive Council. We're streaming live to you right now on LinkedIn and on Twitter, and we welcome anyone who's watching and wants to participate in today's conversation to pop in your question, and I will run it by my guest today, and we'll be watching for that and do our best to respond. I'm so pleased today to be joined by Angela Yoakum, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Transformation and Digital Officer at Novant Health. Novant Health is based in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it's a nonprofit high growth healthcare system with 30,000 team members serving 15 hospitals and more than 700 clinics and physician centers across five southern states. Angela joined Novant in January of 2018 as its chief digital and technology officer and bringing with her a broad cross-industry technology leadership from a Fortune 500 companies such as BDP International, AstraZeneca, Dell, Bank of America, and Rent-A-Center. Her initial mission was to help this healthcare organization redefine its approach to technology by developing a strategic vision for using digital capabilities that would expand access to healthcare and also to improve the quality of care. With Novant's chief medical officer, Angela also co-leads the Institute of Innovation and Artificial Intelligence. And last month, her digital officer role grew into a broader transformation role that we'll talk about more in a moment. But I asked Angela to join me here today on CIO Leadership Live to talk not only about her experiences as a digital leader who reports to CEOs, but also about the many years of experience that she has gathered in governance. She has had several roles on the other side of the boardroom table, essentially working side by side with the people who are the CEO's bosses. Last summer, Angela was appointed to an independent director board seat with the U.S. Board for Zurich American Insurance Group, which is a subsidiary of the Swiss insurance giant Zurich Insurance Group. For the past decade, her governance experience has included several private boards, a uh, venture capital back tech startup, several nonprofit boards, and the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh, which is an SEC registrant. And the idea for today's focus of the show came from an interview that I did with Angela a few months ago as I was researching one of my own boardroom-bound columns for CIO.com. The topic then was why CIOs should not wait until retirement to start building up their board credentials and their own skills in the boardroom on that other side of the boardroom table. And it was a wonderful interview. It was a great column that I've gotten a lot of response for, and it answered that question of exactly how does a highly accomplished, incredibly busy, committed, full-time business technology leader manage to do both, be 110% devoted to your technology leadership job, and also expand your business chops and your board credentials outside of that. So that's what we're here to find out today. And uh, thank you very much, Angela, for joining us. It's delightful to see you again. It's always good to see you. All right. Now, before we dive into your board experience and the um, and your expanded role at Novant Health, tell me how you and your team are doing. I think that whole question about how are you doing today has taken on such greater weight and importance to us all, just as human beings. How is everything going? You know, I was I was reflecting on the past year this morning and how proud I am of our remarkable team. Um, First, we had to respond to the pandemic. Uh, Then we had to recover from the shutdown when we reopened all the clinics and all of our ORs. And and now we're figuring out how to best vaccinate thousands of people each day uh, outside the normal 25,000 we see as part of normal operations. And throughout all of this, our team members have experienced all of the challenges that everyone else has. Sure. Loss loss of a loved one, um, health issues of their own or health issues in the family loss of an income, or, you know, if nothing else, disruption of normal routines and and comfort levels. Some of our team members 
have been giving everything they have to improve the health of our communities, sometimes at the expense of their own well-being. So, you know, while I've been tremendously impressed by the team and grateful that they are with us in this fight, I worry. But sure. thank you for asking. Well, sure. I, I, I can't think of a more incredibly high stress occupation these days than healthcare frontline workers. Um, my own daughter is a, an addiction psychiatrist working with, um, with communities in Newark, New Jersey. And I worry about her every day as well. So I know that this is just, it's been an enormously, it's been an enormously distracting time for everyone, but it's it's also been an incredible time in various other ways, especially as we've seen the kind of accomplishments that we, uh, the way we've been able to keep going because of digital transformation work that goes on. So let's talk about that whole change in your own role. Um, you and I have talked many times over the years, you've been a CIO, you've been a chief digital officer, but there's something that has changed with this addition of transformation to your role. What's, what is different in your day-to-day -day concerns? Well, my team and I have a pretty broad remit. Uh, we are responsible, of course, as we were from the beginning for what would typically be called IT, uh, plus digital health, um, plus a device company, plus a tech services sales organization, um, mm -hmm. everything to do with data and cognitive computing. And, and of course we share, as you mentioned, responsibility for the uh, Institute of Innovation and AI with our chief medical officer and his team. Mm -hmm. So as we think about adding onto that, um, the transformation part of my role, that's all about defining new business models and new revenue streams over and above those that I just mentioned. Um, it, it, whether or not they have a technology component, although so few things don't. Um, also nurturing smaller lines of business that maybe haven't received a lot of investment historically mm -hmm. and just general business transformation activity. And by the way, there's a lot of that in healthcare. And I think that's probably something that might surprise people who don't have, say, someone in healthcare in their family, and and then they may not be hearing about the the, the incredible. Like you have product lines that are now part of your responsibilities, and it's you don't tend to think of. Um, uh, healthcare companies in that sort of uh, range these days. Tell us something about, uh, you know, wh what counts as a product. What sort of, you mentioned that it's medical devices as well. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, we, we actually sell products like physical mm -hmm. devices. <laughs> sure. And we also, we also um, provide technology services to other smaller healthcare organizations Um we provide those services internally, obviously, to Novant Health. So why not to other organizations? Yeah. Um, we we also provide uh, health and wellness services to our um, corporate community members. These uh, services are um, a composite set of things that include um, technology capabilities, which are the pieces that I'm responsible for. The mm -hmm. actual line of business for corporate services lives in a, one of my peers' uh, organizations. But there are so many things that I guess every company should start thinking about. In fact, Mary Fran, if you'll indulge me for a minute, my, my favorite soapbox topic right now is this notion that we have to stop thinking about ourselves as being part of a defined industry. Because the companies that are dominating multiple industries are those who haven't boxed themselves in artificially with those industry um, definitions. Okay. So these are, we think about foundational capabilities that Every company that is succeeding and thriving in a, in a world that requires extreme agility, um, that, you know, it, a world in which consumer appetites continue to shift, mm -hmm. you know, a world in which, you know, the, the, the bounds of industry are getting blurrier and blurrier, okay. then don't call yourself a healthcare company. And this was defined as a healthcare company is defined as XYZ 20 years ago. Therefore, that's exactly what we do. We don't do anything more, anything less. And that's our core business. And we're never going to do anything else we may be underserving our communities if we stick to that sort of artificial bound. So we've seen it in FinTech with banking. We've seen it in services and the hospitality and all of the other industries. Retail, my goodness, was the first to be disrupted. Let's yes. not, uh, let's just abandon this notion of industry boundaries. 
And uh, it's a it's a really great point. And I uh, remember years ago having a conversation with someone about the innovation opportunities in the adjacencies in the things that are around your business and ways, because it's really about leveraging a reputation and your brand mm -hmm. with uh, with with your customers, your patients, your suppliers, your partners. Uh, you know, it's def it's definitely it's a very changing world. And I think that the incredibly uh, the foundational role of digital capabilities is actually one of the things that has really changed that game so much. Um, and let's talk a little bit about that. I remember some years ago when Chief Digital Officer role came up. It's probably a good 10 years old at this point, the role. And there's always, whenever there's a new chief title in an industry, that you have the inevitable debates and stories about, oh, this is replacing the CIO, and oh, well, what, what does the Chief Marketing Officer think of this? Isn't that her job? You know, this sort of thing. So how has the Chief Digital Officer role evolved in just the past five years? That's something you've been very, I, I think, not only deeply engaged with doing the job, but also influencing the way the job changes. That's such a great observation. You know, it's almost impossible to think about the Chief roles, with the possible exception of the CEO and the CFO. Yeah. Um, we can't really look at the role title and make any more than the most general assumptions about what it does these days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some chief digital officer roles have evolved into massive roles, you know, as, as we just discussed, you know, with IT responsibilities plus RevGen plus other, and, you know, some roles, some chief digital officers are, you know, three levels down from the CIO focused on, you know, running the consumer surveys or the like, you know, uh, and I think, I think what we have to do is, um, you know, just as I, just as I'm, as I'm a proponent of abandoning artificial boundaries related to industry, I think I'm probably also a proponent of abandoning um, defining roles by traditional titles. Um, I think it's much more interesting to talk about how we optimize our organizational structure, the, how we define appropriate scope of responsibility. Um, how we think about the sophistication of the capability set that is defined and managed by a given role. Mm -hmm. and, you know, what are the interdependencies? You know, how do we simplify such that we can optimize for either speed or agility or or resiliency or or, or whatever our optimization goals are? Um, and then we just call it something that allows us to pay someone market. <laughs> I mean, that's really that's really what we 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 you know we can oversimplify it a bit. And probably get to a faster, better outcome as opposed to trying to confine ourselves to to maybe what the industry is telling us this role should be doing. Right. right. And I think that's probably a point that I suspect resonates with a lot of the chief tech people that are in the audience, because mm -hmm. who among us has not been put in the tech box <laughs> and told, you know what, you're going to do the technology implementation. We're going to come over here. We're going to make all the adult decisions. Yeah. And we'll just tell you what to do. Now, the good news is I joined Novant Health because not in a million years would Novant Health do that. We are um, every single member of the executive team at Novant Health. Um, and by the way, we come from a variety of different industries. Um, everyone has a pretty impressive amount of digital um, uh, fluency. As you'd expect with any any um executive role to have these days. If you want to be a success, it, it, you can't you can't walk into an executive role today and say, gosh, you know, this finance stuff, it really confounds me. I don't really understand it. it, it nor would you ever say that about technology anymore. You can't walk into a, any role and say, gosh, you know, my grandson had to help me with my phone the other day. I mean, mm -hmm. no one's ever going to say that. Everyone gets it now. And uh, and, and, and I, I happen to to, to have the privilege of being able to help enable those sorts of very interesting capabilities um, that all of my peer group are, are so interested in and, and so passionate about as well. Well, and I know that's something that I've, um, I, I soapbox a lot about that as well in my boardroom column, because CIOs, uh, just chief anything on the technology side, has such a wonderful opportunity to just expand the mindset and the understanding of those board members, you know, the average board member in, in the Fortune 500 is 64 years old and he's a white male and he's, his background has been finance and business. And, you know, the, the ones who are more secure in themselves are willing to say, I really don't know very much about the technology stuff. It's such a great opening 
to just step in and say, well, not so much technology, let's talk about digital capabilities. In fact, we have our first question from our live watching audience, and it's about the uh, data strategy for Novant Health. And um, talk a little bit about how that is formulated, how you describe it, and I know you'll be very conversant with it, even though you have a chief data officer who reports to you. Um, how do you answer questions like that? Because the data-driven nature of companies like yours and organizations like yours is really tantamount. That's exactly right. And that is an excellent question. And that is exactly the question to be asked when you're thinking about any significant um, uh, effort within a, uh, within a complex company, particularly those um, yes. within a traditional industry bound that's under transformation. So um, one of the first things that I did when I joined three, three years ago, a little over three years ago, was to recruit a world-class chief data officer. Um, mm -hmm. Many of you may know Carl Hightower. He came in, he brought on board a tremendous team um, that is responsible for not just traditional enterprise information management such, you know, capabilities. So for example, when you think about, you know, how is your data stored? How do we think about our data? How do we describe our data? How do we move it? How, how, at what point is it transformed? How is it, you know, what, at what point is it encrypted? When is it not? You know, all, all those sort of classic, you know, what's master data? How do we manage master data? All those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, that's kind of classic EIM. So all of that is handled and, and handled very well. And by the way, those are not simple questions to answer, especially not to answer optimally. So um, his team has spent a great deal of time and I think done a great job helping us get our arms around the business, the, the language of our business, mm -hmm. and the, the elements that are most important to making decisions in our business. And by the way, the things that are most important to help us identify the health condition of our patients. So that's when we start getting into some of the more um, uh, the, the newer things that, that Carl and his team have introduced into our estate. So for example, um, we have a strong cognitive computing team. Um, we have real live data scientists who work in our, our team that are doing some pretty remarkable things. Yeah. There are a lot of technology vendors who will sell us capability sets um, that look at our clinical data um, and, and help us identify trends and, and may help us do some prediction. And what we found is that while, um, while they, they're better than nothing, and, and some of them are quite sophisticated, but you know, mm -hmm. generally speaking, sometimes if we have something fairly precise, we need to know, or we need to predict, um, we can get to it pretty fast with our own folks. Um, so we, we have built that capability out um, with some, some brilliant people who, who do some amazing work and have done some industry leading work. And as a result, we're now able to think about our data uh, which by the way, we host in a, a data lake, cloud-based data lake, access through a robust API layer. Um, and, you know, so that allows us to operate on our data um, through a variety of uh, mechanisms. And in um, the data is not just our clinical data, it's, it's, it's you know, behavioral data, it's um, data that you know, comes from a variety of sources, some of it's commercially available, other parts of it are, not, are, are from other you know, devices that stream in. And you know, as we look at this, yeah, um, as we ask questions of ourselves, you know, what what do we wish we knew um, in a clinical setting or in an operational setting that we don't that we don't know today? Um, that team can get us those answers pretty quickly, and it's been so essential and so differentiating for us as we've responded to the the COVID crisis in particular. Well, and I was imagining that when you talk to your Novant board about the data strategy, say you're onboarding a whole new board member and they just, you know, they run in, I was going to say we run into each other in the hallway. We don't do that so easily these days, but eventually we will. Um, and they say, uh, Angela, give me the top line on what our data strategy is. I would imagine it, it links right back to the delivery of the quality of care. Oh, a hundred percent. So we think about, I think you mentioned it in the opening. There's a, we think about access to care. We want to expand access to care. That's when we think a lot about our digital health space. And then we want to increase the quality of care. My goodness, everything about quality of care, as well as quality of our operations. Yeah. Is dependent upon our understanding of, of the data that defines everything that we do. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, yeah, it is directly linked. Yes. Well, we have another question, which I think is a good follow-up from our audience. And this is an advice question for organizations. Uh, what do they need to address in their foundational capabilities 
before embarking on digitization efforts? Oh. It's a, I guess it's a cart before the horse kind of question in a way, um, but you've been in so many different industries and organizations, so you've probably seen all different scenarios of that. So uh -huh. would you advise organizations to uh, take care of foundational things first? And if so, how? So, I, you know, I think you can, the first thing to ask yourself, because the answer to that question is going to be different, but the process by which you arrive at the answer can be, a, you know, fairly similar. Okay. So the first thing that you can do is ask yourself, what are the outcomes that my business is trying to achieve? Short-term, medium-term, long-term, right? And then you start thinking, before you even set about defining a strategy for how you're going to achieve that outcome, just think to yourself, what are the, what are the foundational capabilities that I'm likely to need in support of these outcomes? Mm -hmm. And you know, you're, you'll find that you start defining your strategy and the required capabilities simultaneously. And a lot of the capability sets that you define will end up being, um, it, it'll become obvious to you. It should become obvious to you, which have to be more robust in advance of others, uh, in advance of the, the evolution of the others. And, uh, and, and, and I think understanding the interdependency between some of the capabilities that you define, um, understanding which ones you can achieve and, and provide opportunistically, uh, perhaps over others that may require a little more effort. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are the sorts of things you, you consider when you think about priority. Um, and, and what is foundational to you is, is likely to be um, likely to go beyond just the traditional um, infrastructural elements and capability sets that we tend to think about as, as foundational. Right. Excellent. Good answer. Thank you. Now, one part of the your new role that we talked about earlier was about the unconventional partnership mm -hmm. aspects of the work in terms of building and growing revenue streams. How did that start for you? Years ago, I'm going to guess maybe 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. 2011. There was an article in the HBR, forgive me for mentioning another publication. No problem at all. <laughs> Harvard Business Review, everybody should read it all the time. I have lots of, lots of friends who have worked there. It's actually, it's a wonderful business journal. I found, I found that as well. Um, so it is, uh, there was an article about a, uh, one of the inter large energy companies that had set up an innovation network. They had recognized um, early on that it was no longer reasonable to expect that they all of the great ideas about energy would come from within their four walls. And so they, they started building out a formal network of mm -hmm. third parties with whom they interacted as they tried to create you know, new, new ways of operating, new ways of working. And, and I remember being struck by that. Um, uh, and, and at the time I was working with AstraZeneca, I was working at AstraZeneca as the, as a chief technology officer and a colleague of mine, a brilliant guy named John Reinders. Uh, and I spent a lot of time talking about what that, what that, um, might look like at AstraZeneca. And we, we built, we, we set about building that, um, certainly within the, the, the R and D organization, there was a lot of that same sort of approach going on, you know, that the, the research that was happening in pharma was happening a lot of the, especially in the, in the life sciences space that um, it was happening in these smaller labs. And mm -hmm. so the partnership, so we started thinking about ways we could facilitate formal relationships with smaller labs and so on and it grew. And then I started thinking, why, why not do that inside of a traditional technology organization? Why would we rely on either what we could develop in our four walls or what we purchase from large vendors, which by the way, I love large vendors, they're wonderful, nothing against them, but they're not gonna provide everything to us that we need. And so there's no longer a conversation about buy versus build. There's a conversation about, do I build, do I buy, or do I maybe co-create with a third party? Maybe that third party is a, a startup. Maybe, maybe I adopt a software, uh, excuse me, maybe I adopt a solution from a startup that doesn't yet have a commercially available product. Maybe maybe I help them, you know, land the plane on their product, um, and and there and therefore get to market with the capability before my before my competition does. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it all started with this idea, and then once you have this idea, I guess it it was easy to sort of expand it to thinking about ways in which we could go to market together with a variety of other entity types, uh, ways in which we could help um, lend, if not 
developers, maybe we lend subject matter experts in our industry. And, and we've, as a result, it, it, in my experience across a variety of industries in which I've worked, um, it's, it's relatively easy to do. And it, it's something that I think every technology leader needs to, needs to have as, as just part of a way, a basic way of working. Well, and I've noticed too over time talking with uh, technology leaders like yourself uh, and and many others in different industries that when we start talking about uh, vendor management, for instance, the first point everybody tends to make is that I don't want to work with vendors. I want to work with partners, and that whole approach and that whole willingness to you know it's what are my suppliers and partners bringing to us that we can use. We're happy to help support them and to invest in their products and so forth, but do they, how much do they understand my business and that sort of thing? So I think that that's very, it's not so much leading edge with CIOs anymore as I think that it's in that best practices bucket about, it's not about vendors that you buy things for from, it's partners that you work with and suppliers who are fueling different parts of your business. Let us now, let's say if you're just joining us, this is CIO Leadership Live, and I am joined today by Angela Yoakum, who is the Chief Transformation and Digital Technology Officer at Novant Health. And we are going to switch our conversation over now from, oh, I, I want to call it, it's not exactly typical CDO business because you do a lot of so many different business parts of your role as a technology leader. But I want to switch over and talk about the board, your board and governance career. And let's start by rolling back a decade to the first experience you had in your board career. How did that opportunity arise? I find that every CIO I know, every chief digital officer who serves on outside boards, everybody's got an origin story where it all started for them. So tell us your origin story. I think, uh, thank you for that question. That's a great question. Uh, I think I'd like to answer that in two parts. Mm -hmm. I first, you know, my first for profit board, I'll tell you that story. Mm -hmm. But then I think I also would like to share, if I can, the, how I feel about service in general. Yes. Because uh, that's important. It's an important part of my origin story. Um, so my first for profit board, outside of those that were affiliated with my executive roles, um, was the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh. A dear friend of mine, although at the time I didn't know her well, mm -hmm. um, asked me about my interest in serving on a board. And we had a couple of long conversations. Um, mm -hmm. She, she suggested I throw my name in the hat as a candidate for an open board position um, that, you know, she, she was on that particular board as well. And the rest is history. So that's, that's how that went for me. And by the way, I've shared a lot of stories um, with others who, who have also found their first board seat through um, people that they know. A personal um, connection. Personal so connection. In your yeah. network. Now, as it relates to general board service and community service, um, mm -hmm. That's seen something. That's something that I've 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 had modeled in my own family for as long as I can remember. My parents have always served in and supported groups promoting health and education, equity, sustainability, the arts, veterans, uh, other civic issues, and, and they instilled in me from a very early age um, the belief that if you can work and there is work to be done, uh, then you know what are you waiting for? Go go get it done. <laughs> and so um, they they were. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Find the time, create the time to find, do it. Find the time, you know, go get it done. So uh, with that, with that as my example, um, you know, I think, I think service in, in whatever form it takes is, is something for which we can always, we can always make the time. Yes. Well, and I've had many conversations with CIOs over the years about <clears throat> the whole concept of servant leadership. And the idea that you are, and it, it's not necessarily applying to board work, but it is the notion that you are in a leadership position because that puts you in a better position to help, to help people around you, to help the people working for you, to help your companies and so forth. Um, many CIOs will, their first likely board position will, it's very likely 75% of the time you find it through a personal connection, usually someone in the business community, not necessarily another chief information officer. So a lot of times nonprofit boards will come up as uh, a, your first service example. And there's often debate in the board world. I think people assume that 
if you've served on a nonprofit board, it's some kind of a natural stepping stone to a for-profit or a private board. Not necessarily the case. It comes down to a lot of, depends on the industry, your own networks and so forth. But tell us why you have found, you've been on several nonprofit boards, and I think you're currently serving on a couple of them in your own community in Charlotte. So uh, we know it doesn't necessarily need to lead to a paid board seat. Why is it worthwhile? to be part of a nonprofit board and to seek that? Yeah, yeah three, three reasons. Uh, first, you have the opportunity to do something meaningful <laughs> for the community in which you live. So that's, that's number one, right? And that's why most people serve. Um, secondarily, it gives you an opportunity to exercise those muscles that you know, are un understanding how another complex organization works. Mm -hmm. um, it might expose you to different problem sets than you're used to seeing, um, perhaps different industries, different company types, different sorts of problems, different sorts of um, political structures inside of the organization. This exposure allows you to, to, to expand your own understanding of organization. I think that's important. That's something that we all need uh, in our day jobs. So, so I think you learn something from it um, outside of just serving the community. And the third thing I will say is that how better, so if you look at, if you look at nonprofit boards, you look at who's serving on these nonprofit boards. Um, oftentimes there are people who are in big, big executive roles. And so they're learning from you just as you're learning from them. And one of the things that they're going to learn is how you operate. They're going to learn how you work. And so if, if, you know, if you're if you're in it purely for selfish reasons, this gives you an opportunity to show what your talents bring to an organization that needs your talents. Um, so, yes, I, you yes. know, I, I would say everyone wins if you join a nonprofit. It, it's not going to lead to a, a for-profit board. Um, that is not a stepping stone in the that the executive recruiting community uh, finds meaningful. And by the way, it, it often is irrelevant in terms of skill sets, mm -hmm. but from a as you build your own foundational capabilities, those muscles, you need to do that anyway, just as just as part of your personal growth. Well, it's a wonderful way too to build your business network. Because as as much as and I've worked with CIOs for well over 20 years now, and I'm a huge fan of a strong CIO network. I mean, it's one of it's one of my when people say, Oh, what's your superpower? You know, I, I love that question because it, it's not just about whether you can bake bread or not. It's basically my superpower is knowing so many CIOs and having this wonderful network. But that wonderful network of CIOs will not lead to board success. It's your business community friends, those CEOs and chief financial officers that you meet on the nonprofit board. So I think that's a great point. Now, let's think about today's boardroom talent needs just in general for private company boards, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 boards. Is there anything, especially in light of the global pandemic that we've been going through now, is there anything that makes this a better time for full-time senior executives like yourself to think about board service or to reach out? Why, why would a board need your capabilities today? Talk about that. Well, if you think about, think about what we're seeing in the world today, um, everybody's talking about how rapidly the world is changing. And businesses of all sorts are thinking about unconventional competitors and they're thinking about changing market opportunities and changing customer appetites. And, you know, everyone acknowledges that the biggest challenge is the rapidity of the change happening around them. Who, what type of executive, <laughs> what type of executive has been best positioned to deal with rapidly changing or advancing capability sets over the last 20 years? I would say it's the technology executive, the one who's been running the estates that have, you know, that, that you know, wh whose landscape shifts every half year. Mm -hmm. um, we're in the middle of it. We're very well positioned to help with agility, um, to help with um, the, all of the new, the new muscles that all of the companies are trying to build and all of these boards need as they, as they, as they guide their management team, as they ask questions of their management team, as they pressure test the management team's work. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I think that that is probably the first reason why it's a great time for technology leaders to, to reach out and, and, and look for opportunities to serve in this capacity. And the second is, of course, that it's impossible to separate any of the advances that are happening in any of the industries 
again, I said I don't like to talk about industries, but across the industry spectrum, um, all of those changes are enabled by some sort of technology advance or some sort of unprecedented, but now available access to data. Mm -hmm. um, and that's our world. So, you know, it, it, why would we, why would we form up a board that doesn't have the perspective of somebody who understands that accelerating force and again, can ask the right questions of the management team to make sure that that's being taken into consideration, not just from a risk mitigation perspective as it relates to operational risk, but also as a, as a future state, future planning strategic sort of risk uh, mitigation. So. Well, there's a lot being written today too about the changing nature of the board's governance responsibilities. I mean, it's certainly oversight and the shareholder value and making sure the company is profitable and, and gu gu guiding it away from you know wrong directions certainly are very core to what board members are needed to do today. But there's also stakeholder attention now when the I've read so much of board literature over the last year or so that points out the incredible importance of diversity and inclusion and equality quality and how those issues, I just, I have a column being published next week about uh, environmental, societal, and governance issues, the ESG, which is, and one of the tie-ins there for CIOs is that ESG is going to come down to a lot of data that the boards are going to need. I mean, there's not a lot of regulatory requirements around ESG data yet, but the big institutional investors are all paying a lot of attention to it. And mm -hmm. I think, and I like when I say diversity that way, I actually mean diversity kind of writ large, where it's diversity of thought and background and education and capabilities. I love the way you always talk about capabilities rather than tech technology skills, because it really does reach across uh, different opportunities that are out there. Have you found that serving on outside boards, has that helped you work more effectively with your own board at Novant Health, at, you know, Rent-A-Center when you were there, all the different, what, five or six companies where you have been involved in during most of that time, I think from AstraZeneca on, you've been involved in board work. How did you find that it helped you with your own company board? I think uh, two ways. First, of course, it allowed me to see our engagement through their, you know, with, with wearing the board hat. I, I understand what, what the sorts of things they're likely to be looking for. I, mm -hmm. I, had, a, I had a perspective that was similar to theirs and, and that helped me. But I think maybe less obviously, but equally, if not more important, is the type of exercise that serving on a, a board allows me to, to perform mm -hmm. that helps me just be a better version of myself. So professional athletes, and I always, by the way, I should preface this by saying, I always get in trouble when I try to do some sort of sports analogy. So I'm not gonna try to be terribly specific. <laughs> I never try it either, because yeah. I, mix, I mix all that stuff up. I'm just yeah. not, a foul. I, I can talk about classical music and pianists, but I can't really say yeah. much about sports. <laughs> I'm gonna try. So we okay. all know, even those of us, um, I have a dear friend, um, Clint, who refers to his favorite sport as sports ball. And I'm like, yes, so <laughs> even if you have a sports ball <laughs> player, um, so somebody, we, we know football players, for example, sometimes take, you know, ballet, ah, or yoga. Mm -hmm. right. Or yoga. Mm -hmm. We know that regardless of the nature of the athletics in which you're engaging, you have a whole set of conditioning exercises you have to go through. Right. And, you know, you're in there with your athletic trainers, you're in there with your strength coaches, you're in there with, you know, I don't know. See, this is where my, my, my knowledge Peter's out, but you know, you're in there with a whole bunch of people who are, who are not running you through football drills. If you're a football player, right? You're, you're, you're not only practicing football over and over and over again. You're also doing all the flexibility work. You're doing all the strength training work. You're doing all the other stuff that helps your muscles be more explosive. If that's what you're looking for, be faster. If that's what you're looking for, or be more resilient. If that's what you're looking for. And yeah. I think for executives, our mental muscles are, um, they need to be exercised, not just in doing the actual job that is ours to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. And how do we exercise those muscles? We read, we attend industry events, but my goodness, what about getting into the weeds of another industry, another company, understanding someone else's problems that are not the ones that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? There is no better conditioning exercise that will make you a better version of who you show up to be at work. Mm -hmm. I'm a strong believer that, 
that CEOs should encourage their executive teams to do exactly that. Yes. Well, and that's that's actually a great segue to my next question that comes up every time I make this argument to my very busy full-time CIO friends about you should be looking into board service. And they say, well, I kind of have a job that's 120% of my time, Mary Fran. What are you talking about? How do you convince a CEO? Because anyone who's working full-time at a company, you are all uh, fiscally responsible. You're fiduciary officers of your companies. Mm -hmm. How do you convince the CEO that there's a benefit for him or her and the company for you to be involved in another company. I, of course, not a competitor, but spending any of your time not thinking about them and, and their little world. Um, so talk to that a little bit, because I'm sure you've had those conversations with CEOs. I will say that I've been, I've been pretty fortunate. So I've worked for a number of CEOs who, who understand that to be a stronger exec, um, you have to understand how a variety of different businesses work, how they operate. They, they, they get it. Um, they themselves often serve on boards of very different sorts of companies. I that's mean, true. that's true. Uh, they often do. So that's, yeah. You know, in, in understanding, you know, how governance works in, increases an executive's impact uh, in their own company. I mean, that's it's almost common sense. Um, and so I've been fortunate in that that the the, the significant that the CEOs for whom I've worked have all all understood that and are 100% behind that mission. Um, I haven't, yeah, I, I would say that I probably would not go to work for a CEO who didn't, who didn't think that, who needed to be convinced otherwise. Um, because I think if you, if you believe that everything that one might ever need to learn is contained currently within one's own business as it exists today, mm -hmm. I think that's fairly dangerous because your business isn't gonna look the same in three years. Again, because of industry disruption that's happening so rampantly, every industry is going to look very different three, four, five years from now than it does today. Mm -hmm. And so focusing on and, and specializing in only the world of today in which you're in which you're operating mm -hmm. um, puts you at risk. And so I, I certainly hope that executive teams are not being encouraged to to focus inwardly only. Right. It doesn't seem like a good idea. It seems especially not like a good idea right now <laughs> with everything changing so much. What about the time factor? I mean, when I look at your LinkedIn profile, it's a little daunting. When I think about the job you have, you get promoted consistently, you take on more business responsibilities, and yet you've still got a couple, uh, you serve on two um, for-profit you know, serious board seats, the one for the big insurance company, and then I believe another one. And you also um, work with venture capital based startups in an advisory role. Where are you finding all the time for this, Angela? <laughs> that's a really, that's a very serious question, even though I'm kind of like rolling my eyes about it. Where do you find the time for this? Yeah. No, it's a valid question. Mm -hmm. So um, every day does not look like every other day. Okay. So there are some days where I don't think about anything. In fact, in recent days, um, you know, since the since the new year, mm -hmm. I've been pretty consistently head down with a couple of things that are happening in the American Heart Association world. Um, otherwise, I'm I'm pretty heads down on what's happening in Novant Health. We're trying to vaccinate an entire you know states of people, yeah. um, and it's you know under some changing, frequently changing constraints. Um, so, so I've, I've been pretty heads down at work. Um, however, in normal course of events, although I hate to, you know, I don't want to presume that we'll ever be fully normal again, but, um, I'm, I'm, I have a couple of things, a uh, couple of secret weapons. So Good. you asked, you know, you said your superpower is your network. Um, by the way, I think that I think that your superpower is your ability to um, understand context very, very quickly when you meet people and your ability to keep those details in your head and understand connections between all the people in your network forever. I think that's your superpower. Um, and, and the ways in which you influence the industry is, is phenomenal. But anyway, that aside, um, one of my superpowers is that I read extraordinarily quickly. Mm -hmm. So I can plow through about 400 pages in an evening. So um, when it comes to being, uh, when it comes to absorbing a lot of material that's very mm -hmm. um, complex, yes. very quickly, um, it doesn't take me weeks and weeks to do. It takes me 
what I, what I what I like to do is I I try to plow through as much material as I can, absorb it, and then what I like to do is think about it in my off cycles. So when I'm walking my dogs, or when I'm you know yes. making dinner, or you know doing the dishes, or whatever, I start thinking about what I've read. I start applying it. I start expanding upon it. That's where the real magic happens for me. The so connection. Consumption. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's where the connections happen. Your different yes. neurons are just firing differently. Yes. That's right. So, so I, I consume very quickly and then I let it, you know, I let it marinate <laughs> over time. And, and that's, that's how I learn. That's how I operate. And that's how I, I balance so many different things. Um, if, you know, it's, um, as long as I can do that so far, as, as my parents always said, you know, if you can work, <laughs> you should work, get it done. Yes. So that's, what, that's what I'm doing. That's great. Well, and I have, uh, there are so many, there's a couple of things I've been recommending to my friend, because I like to also listen to podcasts and that sort of thing while I'm doing like, you know, puttering around in the kitchen or, or out in my garden and everything. And there's two podcasts that I've been recommending, especially if you're interested in board service. Um, it is, I, I've been calling it the digital twin. There's a boardroom bound podcast that is actually, it's a, um, uh, the, a band named Alexander Lowry, who is a CFO trained, he's a college professor in Massachusetts, and he's been doing this boardroom bound podcast. It has nothing to do with my column. I just happened to pick the same kind of name. He's actually, I think, got a, a patent on his name, and he's been allowing me to use boardroom bound in my CIO.com column every week. He interviews someone on this podcast about different issues. He's on a mission to help board members become better at what they're doing. And now that Alexander and I have met, I'm on a mission to get more CIOs interviewed, CIOs and chief digital officers interviewed, because he's done over a hundred of these interviews, but they're mostly people from the business world. And when I looked through the list, I only saw one CTO on the list. So Alexander and I have a pact going where I'm gonna send him more. In fact, I'm sure I'll be introducing you to him, Angela. So I recommend listening to Alexander's podcast. And there's also just a new one that I mentioned to you that Brene Brown, the famous social researcher on human emotion, is doing. It's called Dare to Lead. And I posted about it on LinkedIn the other day because I think it's just phenomenal. And she's been interviewing all kinds of people about leading through. She started this podcast like two months ago. So it's right in the midst of the pandemic. And it's all kinds of wonderful, um, wonderful interviews with people that are really paying a lot of attention to these elements. So let me uh, switch gears one more time and say, uh, talk about the, your work on the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. When I was looking through your whole list of all the things that you've served on, I look at that and I think, oh, well, you probably have an MBA and all this financial expertise behind you. So uh, how, did, how did that experience come about? And you served for over two years on that board. What did you learn there? And how did that all happen? Mm -hmm. Well, first, let me say the only reason I left that wonderful board, which was such a strong board, yeah. um, is because there's a, regulata there's a regulatory requirement that the board members live in the region. And when I left, when I left the region to move to Texas, I had to resign from the board, and it was just heartbreaking because what a wonderful group of people um, doing, you know, doing good work, doing the right work. Um, yeah, so that board was was actually the board that I, I mentioned to you um, having having joined as a result of a conversation with a dear friend who, who at the time I, I didn't know as well, um, mm -hmm. but, but certainly came to know over time. Um, and so that's how that came about. I had a, the privilege of serving, um, I think I started serving on the operational risk committee, the, um, uh, the operational risk committee and governance uh, and public policy committees. Uh, and that was, that was fascinating. Um, operational risk is of course, right up my alley. At the time, it was right up my alley, still is, obviously. Okay. Um, the um, governance and public policy, the governance side of that was more like a non-gov committee. Mm -hmm. and, and the public policy piece was something new. So I had an opportunity to um, look at how, you know, it's an it's a organization that was regulated by an entity, um, the same entity that regulates uh, Fannie and Freddie, or we used to regulate Fannie and Freddie. So it's, it's really regula regulators that you don't typically read about uh, in the paper. So it was, it was interesting to learn more about that and how that works. Um, and then I moved into being the vice chair of the Enterprise Governance Board and also joined the audit committee ultimately. So very, um, 
very, uh, very wonderful. My, I, I do have experience in banking. Um, so I was, I worked for SunTrust for a few years and Bank of America for a few years. I mean, I, it's not as if I, I didn't have an understanding of banking. Federal home loan banks, though, I wasn't as familiar with. They are the banks that provide liquidity to other banks. They function more as a co-op, which is really interesting. So they're an SEC registrant, but um, instead of having shareholders, they have members. And so you still, you still are, 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 are um, you're still governing member value, just as you govern shareholder value. Dividends are paid out. You know, there's, there's still, it, it, it operates very much the same as, as, sh- as shareholders, but it's a membership instead, it's a co-op. But you're still the same SEC submissions, the same artifacts have to be crafted. It's this, you know, it's a, a, a variety of regulatory considerations as you consider in any, any number of industries. So those are fantastic. Thank you for asking about that. It was a really fantastic experience and uh, I treasure my time uh, with those, those board members. Well, and I think it's a great example also of how much you can not only learn from getting inside another industry on a board that way, but also what CIOs can bring just because of CIOs and CDOs and chief transformation officers, what you can bring to the table that is different from everything else around the table. Um, mm-hmm. One of the, the people I interviewed for um, a, a virtual event I took part in a few months ago, uh, she was the former uh, president of Princeton University. Mm-hmm. And she was a, she's a very well-known Shirley Teigman, and she's a um, on the Google board. She got asked in 2004 to join the Google board, and she knew Eric Schmidt had called her up, and she knew him because he was a Princeton alumni. So she was always basically, you know, university presidents basically fundraise, right? And so Eric knew her very well, and he called her up one day and he said, come and be on the board. And she said, you know, Silicon Valley, she lives in Princeton, New Jersey at the time, you know? And she ended up being one of the few consumer East Coast academic type people on that board. And we ended up talking about that diversity of thought and knowledge that somebody who's truly an outsider from an industry. So I think there may be a um, there may be a misconception that you can only be on a board where you bring this incredible expertise. It's actually, and that's leading me, um, one of my long-winded rambling questions, leading me into asking you what CIOs and people that are technology leaders, um, what they can bring to boards uh, to give them a new way to think about that as, you know, as the central nervous systems of the way their companies operate. Why do boards need those kind of talents? to come on these days, especially. Um, so again, I think I'm gonna give you an answer in two parts. You're okay. First part, first part what, what CIOs bring on paper, mm-hmm. which is also what they bring in reality. So first part is right. number one, um, part of operational risk management, which is either part of audit committee, it could be part of a separate auto, um, operational or enterprise risk committee. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where you manage um, and, and pressure test management decisions around cyber risk. Yes. And of course, that's also where you pressure test manage, management decisions around um, major technology investments, technology infrastructure, infrastructural considerations, maybe outside of the cyber space, security space. Um, and, and all of that, you know, is within the domain of expertise, presumably, that is held within a CIO, CTO sort of tech leader position. Mm-hmm. Um, the other piece of that on paper answer is uh, that because so many of the business innovations that uh, are coming out of a variety of industries are empowered by, and in, in many cases, entirely enabled by advanced technologies, mm-hmm. again, the people who are the executives who are in charge of those sorts of transformative capabilities are those technology leaders and can bring that same sort of thinking into the discussion with management so that you think about, you know, are you, are you thinking the right way about moving into adjacencies or doing all of these other things that we think about on a daily basis. So that's the on paper answer. Mm -hmm. Now, the other answer that's maybe a little more subtle is again, it's, it's not enough to say I'm the outsider. So I'm going to bring a different perspective Mm -hmm. because you're only going to be the outsider for a short period of time. (laughs) (laughs) Cause pretty soon you're not going to be an outsider anymore unless something has gone terribly wrong. (laughs) You know, So, so, you know, um, 
what we all should be bringing, whether it's to our executive roles or to our board roles, is 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 a is an ag- a mental agility, is a is an understanding that the world around us will shift very very quickly. Is 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 the ability to break down into the most basic components, what's required to be successful and to thrive. Mm-hmm. And that is going to change regardless of in your same industry for 25 years, or if you're in different industries, year, 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 you're going to have to understand when, where those pivot points are occurring, recognize them, anticipate them, uh, get ahead of them and, 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 and be positioned to thrive, whether mm-hmm. you're, um, you know, regardless of industry. So that kind of thinker is, I think, um, I think you can find that kind of thinker again in the technology leadership ranks because yes. of how quickly technology has continued to advance over time yes. and how facile we've had to be as you know in the face of that change. So well, that's that's yeah. very much a practice that you've made as you've built out that senior team that you have of all those different chiefs, you know, <laughs> chief security officer, chief data officer, chief technology officer. I, the IO also, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You look for those kind of thoughts. Yeah. I want to quote something back to you that you said during our interview for that boardroom mm-hmm. column I mentioned, and you were summing up the intrinsic value that you yourself have gotten from serving on different boards and why you along uh, you joined me in thinking that it's so important for technology leaders to get out there and serve on boards. You said, if you believe business innovation will continue at unprecedented rates and that market opportunities will expand and that consumer appetites will keep growing, Realize that your industry won't be the same in five years. That's right. So in, in terms of exercising that that agility and that muscle that helps us deal with change, with all the change around us today, it seems it's it's pretty hard to imagine a better way to do that than to get experience on that other side of the boardroom table. I'm completely biased on this point. So tell me <laughs> if I'm being a Pollyanna about it. Oh. No, you are, you and I are exactly aligned on this. You know, that's, <laughs> I think it is our, if, if someone is paying us to come into work and, and well, virtually or physically or otherwise, and, and, and to do, to, to and, and to make strategic decisions, mm-hmm. and put their strategies in play. We have an obligation to that entity to expand our perspectives beyond the walls of the company as it exists today. Mm-hmm. That, is, that is just an obligation. We, you know, again, I'm going to take a chance with the athletics. You know, you might, you know, you know, a professional sports. Yeah, thank you. A professional sports team hires a professional athlete at the peak of his or her, you know, mm-hmm. physical athleticism, right. and they expect that person to stay in shape. They're not going to be happy if that person comes in, eats a bunch of donuts, and gains 50 pounds, right? That's Similarly, true. executives have to come in and continue to be world class. And we have to make ourselves world class by exercising those muscles. We exercise those muscles by expanding our perspective and getting deep into the weeds and continuing to learn quickly, applying our natural strengths to someone else's problems, learn what it's like to sit on the other side of the table. Um, It's part of our growth. It's part of our personal growth plan as an executive. And and it also allows us to to best lead um, our companies, regardless of industry in this changing world, because they're, as we've said several times, it's. It's a changing world, changing yeah. environment. Yes, and who knows that better than chief information and digital officers? Um, and it also reminds me a couple of CIOs who, all like you, serve on multiple different boards, have pointed out that one of the ways they win that argument with their CEO is they point out that it's basically for the company, it's a free executive education that another company gets to provide for you. It's an, I mean, it's enormous personal growth, I think, for individuals, but in terms of what you bring back to the company, I think that it's a very important, so. That's much more succinct than what I said, and I, but you're exactly right. <laughs> well, exactly thank right. you. Thank you so much for letting me veer off. Usually on Leadership Live, we talk about kind of the usual lineup of CIO topics. It's innovation and business strategy and leadership and talent retention and all that. But this was just a very, I thought that this was a very uh, very appropriate change as we are heading into a whole new decade and a new administration in Washington. And I especially appreciate that you joined me here today instead of watching the inauguration live. So thank you for that, Angela. 
Carla, and I hope I will see you again soon. And in Well, it'd be nice to see you in the real world, but I especially appreciate you joining us today virtually. Thanks so much. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. If you joined us late today, please do not uh, despair. Uh, you can watch the full episode later today on CIO.com, or you can also catch us on YouTube where we have um, the IDG Tech Talk channel has not only this wonderful interview with Angela Yoakum today, but also the 50, 60, I think this might have been number 61. We've kept a whole library of all of these CIO conversations there on our IDG Tech talk channel and i hope you enjoyed today's conversation with angela as much as i did and that you will join us again here in two weeks for the next episode of cio leadership live on wednesday february 3rd i'm going to be joined again at 12 noon eastern by Justin Kershaw, who is the Chief Information Officer at Cargill, the ag giant, the agricultural giant company, one of the largest privately held companies in the United States. And take a moment before you leave us to check out that IDG YouTube channel there, and you'll be able to find all the previous episodes. And thanks so much for joining us today. Stay well and safe out there, and we'll see you back here again in two weeks.